G'day Dave here. Some of my friends, when they think about the church, kind of think, well, there's no way I'd want to get involved. Why would I go to a place that's gained a reputation for abusing children? Why would I go to a place that's kind of hoarding wealth and defrauding the government of taxes? Why would I go to a place that's outdated and irrelevant? Why would I go to a place where people are constantly arguing and dividing from each other where there's disunity, there's grumbling, there's complaining, where people are unhappy, why would I go there? Surely I've got better things to do on a Sunday. Friends, if that's your picture of church, uh, on behalf of all Christians everywhere, and I have no right to do this, I want to apologise. Uh, we've got it wrong. The reality of what God's Word calls us to is anything but the mess and the oppressive disaster that we've seen in churches, especially in recent times, but it's always been there. Now, God calls his people to be different. God calls his people who are citizens of heaven to actually live out a heavenly reality, transformed lives here and now. We are to be different. And Christian people are to shine out as different. Jesus himself said that people should see the way that Christians treat each other that they would know that they are followers of Jesus because of the love that they have for each other. See, love is to be the hallmark of being Christian. It doesn't mean that other people can't love, but it does mean that Christians are called to love. We are called to love because God has first loved us. Now, Paul has just been arguing about humility and the importance of humility. My understanding is that humility was never considered a virtue before the time of Jesus. But because of Jesus and his ultimate example of humility, now we see humility seen as something to aspire to, something to take hold of, something that's actually very attractive and that does great good. The humble approach we recognize to be the virtuous, the right approach. But there's a humility that comes from knowing God, that comes from being saved by Jesus, that transforms the person from the inside out. And it's something that we are to remember, to take hold of, and yet it's something that we can quickly forget and leave in the past. And let's pick it up in Philippians, because in chapter 2 of Philippians, he talks about the way a Christian community should be seen. Uh, the impact that it should have on those around about them. And it starts with the attitude of the people in the church. Let's uh, see what he says from verse 14. Philippians 2 verse 14, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then, Paul writes, I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. His opening call there is to do everything without grumbling or arguing. And then he picks up a couple of references that remind the reader of events that took place hundreds and hundreds of years before in what the Jewish people still celebrate as their exodus. So the Jewish people have been slaves and oppressed in Egypt. And God rescued them through Moses. Uh, after 10 plagues, they are taken, they go through the Red Sea, and they are out in the wilderness, and they're looking forward to entering into the promised land. It's a journey that should have taken around about two weeks. But the people are there for 40 years. And the reason that they're there for 40 years is quite simply this. They looked back at Egypt and they looked ahead and they grumbled and they complained. They argued and they bickered. You see, they started to think as they faced this time in the wilderness that somehow or other they were better off as slaves. Somehow they were better off when they were in Egypt. And they are failing to trust God, that God is the good God who has delivered them from slavery and is taking them to the land of his promise. And you know, Christians, we can easily forget that God is the good God who's delivered us from a slavery, not to the Egyptians, but a slavery to sin, to death, 
to evil, to destruction, a slavery that keeps us trapped in ourselves, that separates us from God, a slavery that leads to death and to God's judgment. And through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, we are redeemed from that slavery. We're taken out and we're brought into a new relationship with God. We're made citizens in heaven. And we're looking forward to that promised land. And yet in this meantime, we, just like the Israelites, can grumble and complain. And friends, what we see here is that it's completely out of place for God's people. And it means how quick we are to forget all that God has done for us. We have been rescued. We've been released. We've been saved. And we have a glorious future that is locked in and secure for us. God's promises are being kept and yet we grumble and we complain. Sad reality is that's what we see in too many churches. In fact, I think deep down we see some of it in every church. Every church displaying this ugly side, this grumbling, this complaining, this arguing, this division. So true that we've seen churches just come apart century after century, year after year, city and city and town. And here we have a picture of people forgetting all that they've been given. So easy to do, isn't it? We, we look at one church where they're complaining that the music's too loud and yet another church complaining that the music's too old-fashioned. At, at one church where we're complaining that we don't have any old people and another church of old people complaining they don't have enough youth. We have churches that complain that the minister, he might be a great preacher, but he's hopeless at pastoral care. And others complaining their minister, well, he's really good as a pastor, but he can't teach his way out of a brown paper bag. We get people complaining that the leadership is too kind of directional and they're making all these decisions and they're not consultative enough. And others tearing their hair out because they can't make a decision and they keep going around and around in circles one after another. Friends, no leader in a church is perfect. Don't grumble and complain. No church is perfect. Don't grumble and complain. And if you leave a church because it's imperfect and you find a church that you believe to be perfect, don't go there because you'll mess it up. I guarantee it will be imperfect once you're there. See, that's the reality, isn't it? We live lives that are imperfect. We fail and we fail to recognize the wonderful love that God has shown us. And so too often, our, our lives, our relationships, our churches are damaged by our ingratitude, our grumbling and our complaining. And yet Paul, in this letter, down in verse 17, says that he is glad and rejoices with all of the Philippians and so calls upon them too to be glad and to rejoice with him. Friends, here's the contrast. Are we to be a people who are known because we grumble and we complain? We're whingers and we're divisive? Or are we to be known as people who have thankful hearts? Who, who are glad, who are full of gratitude, who are joyful because we've received mercy from God, because God has humbly acted to serve us? Friends, we have every reason to be united together, to be drawn together around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are to hold firm to that word. See, if we forget the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for us, then we will become more and more selfish and we will end up feeling more and more entitled. But the gospel of Jesus reminds us that God has reached out to us and been generous to us. And it promotes gladness and joy. And so let's hold firm to that and let's hold out that word of life to others so that we might shine and we might shine a word of truth. Let our words and our actions be in sync. Let our words be words of life, the truth about Jesus, rather than words of complaint and criticism. And let our relationship be one of unity in the gospel rather than criticism and complaining and opposition. That leads to division and a destruction of the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus wants his church to shine a light 
in the community. If you're part of that church, let me ask you to pray that God will help you to be glad, to appreciate all that he's given you, and to appreciate your brothers and sisters, your fellow citizens in the kingdom of heaven. And if you're not part of the church, let me encourage you, though you will honestly see things that are substandard, you'll see things that are really quite ugly at times, to look beyond that, to look to Jesus, the one who gave his life for you, the one who humbly reached out to bring you into relationship with God. And I want to encourage you to put your trust in that Jesus because he wants you to be right with God and to enjoy eternal life. Thank you.